my name's uh, Joe Stein. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called uh, Elodina. Uh, we're a big data as a service platform. Uh, our stack is pretty much built all on open source software. Uh, we enable customers to analyze data streams in real time and provide uh, reactive analytics uh, to the data events that are flowing through our system. Uh, we also support, uh, provide support for Mesoschedulers, schedulers. So Kafka, Cassandra, HDFS, um, you know, other schedulers that run on Mesos, uh, we support those. Um, also Apache Kafka committer and PMC member. So if anyone wants to talk about Kafka, always happy to chat afterwards about that. Um, catch me on Twitter. I actually just posted the slides. I know some folks like to have the slides during a talk, so you can go and grab them if you like. All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about developing frameworks with Mesos today. Uh, we're going to quickly chat about like what goes on Mesos. Uh, we're then going to kind of start to dive in a little deeper, talking about frameworks, really explaining what a scheduler is, what an executor is, how they work together. Um, we're then I'm then going to kind of talk a little bit about like what it looks like when you don't have a scheduler, so you can kind of understand the problems that you can use to the the problems that you can solve by using a scheduler. Um, and then uh, we're going to kind of walk through what it looks like to have schedulers actually interacting with other schedulers, right? And actually do like scheduler orchestration um, with, with schedulers. And then kind of go through the framework API um, with some examples so that if you want to go and like, you know, start developing frameworks, kind of, you know, the point of this is everyone should leave here wanting to build frameworks for Mesos. All right, so what goes on Mesos? All right, so I am a huge proponent of uh, everything should go on Mesos, right? If you're not using Mesos and you're still doing static partitioning, you might as well go back to like vacuum tubes and punch cards. Um, just my opinion. Uh, lots of stuff is running on Mesos now, right? So there's lots of schedulers. A lot of folks have gone in and actually built systems that run on Mesos that are open source that people can use, and you know, plenty of non-open source uh, schedulers as well. Um, and you can really run anything you want on Mesos, right? Uh, there are schedulers like Marathon and Aurora uh, that are specifically built to do nothing but take your application without having to worry about anything really Mesos related and launch and run it on the Mesos cluster. Cool. So uh, let's talk about frameworks. So a framework is basically a scheduler, right, and an executor. And the scheduler has a driver, right, that allows it to talk to Mesos. And the scheduler is basically responsible for uh, launching applications, killing applications, communicating with the executor, running the actual tasks that are running on the Mesos slave. Um, the executor is the process that's essentially able to launch tasks on the slave. And the flow here is essentially the slave will send offers to the Mesos master and it'll send it to the allocation module, which will then send it to the scheduler. And the scheduler will make a decision saying, hey, you know, do I want this resource or not? And if so, then it will you know, say, hey, I want this resource. And the Mesos master will uh, launch the executor on the slave. Um, if the scheduler doesn't want the resource, then you need to decline it. Um, you know, if you don't decline it, you're basically going to hold on to all the offers, and you know, there'll be no offers in your cluster. So let's talk about the scheduler a little bit. So uh, I like to kind of think of the scheduler as like the com command and control functionality of your applications, right? If anyone doesn't get the Tron reference, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> it's all good. Um, and that's really what a scheduler is, right? It's really like the intelligence around the tasks that are running, and not just launching the tasks, but actually the coordination of the functionality that the application expects when it's running on the slave. And we're, we're going we're to get into that a little bit further. Um, the executors, for all intents and purposes, are like, you know, kind of stupid. Like, they have some purpose and point, right? Um, but there's not uh, always a lot of functionality that um, you're building inside the executor. I mean, there is functionality, of course, um, but really the scheduler is the single point of control for operating all of the tasks that are running for your application. <clears throat> so this is kind of what the uh, Kafka scheduler looks like. Um, I, I, I don't know if uh, folks are familiar with Kafka, if not. Um, we talk after or something, but um, it's a, really for me the best way to kind of explain how schedulers work, essentially. So here we have uh, the Mesos master in the middle, right? We've got the Mesos slave and the Kafka Mesos executor, and the Kafka Mesos executor is responsible for running the broker, and we've got the Kafka Mesos scheduler, right, which is responsible for actually launching brokers, managing them, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, 
And the scheduler also has a uh, CLI and REST HTTP endpoint, um, which is, in my opinion, very important to build when you're building a scheduler, right? Schedulers are intelligent, but it doesn't mean that you know, there isn't some human operator that needs to be able to go and do something or some other system that also wants to you know, decide how to orchestrate uh, the task. Um, you can build auto-scaling into the scheduler, or you can build auto-scaling outside of the scheduler and use the REST API to be able to you know, perform the actions that you're expecting uh, for your applications. And you know, when the brokers run on the Mesos slave, everything at that point uh, is just how it is. Right? There's really no difference from how you use the application uh, at that point in time. Um, so let's kind of talk a little bit about you know, the scheduler for Kafka and kind of you know, where and why it's like, fundamentally useful. I mean, you can take Kafka and run it on Marathon, and it works great. There's obviously some uh, effort that you need to put in for things like uh, the broker ID assignment. Um, but there's a lot more benefit that you get when you're building a scheduler that you can actually build into your applications, right? So first and foremost, schedulers allow you to really create operational automation, right? So in Kafka's case, um, there's a full feature command line that allows you to add brokers, update stats, start, stop, um, really everything that you would expect to be able to control the application that's running on the slave. Uh, there's, as I said, there's a REST API and a CLI. So usually whenever we build a scheduler, we build the REST API, and then we build a CLI that completely wraps the REST API so that you know, humans have a nice way to be able to operate it, but also giving programmatic access for uh, other applications. Um, Schedulers usually run on Marathon um, for high availability, right? So when you have a scheduler, there's really one of them. And uh, you know, if it goes down, you can't schedule any more tasks. So uh, you, know, you kind of want to throw that on Marathon for um, high availability. And then it also handles for things like uh, broker stickiness, right? So Kafka is a persistent server. So you need to make sure that if you've got you know, 20 terabytes of data on one of your machines and the machine rebooted, there's really no reason to go and reschedule the broker on some other machine. Right? So there's intelligence that uh, you want to kind of build into the application. Uh, you know, obviously, as the persistent primitives become more mature and more feature rich, this becomes less of an issue. But for now, it's you know, still kind of a requirement of what you need to build. Um, and then, as I said, the executor is, it's like 16 lines of code. I mean, it's not, but it, 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 it's just about that. Really, all it does is take all the information from the, uh, the launch task, right? So what we do when we build a scheduler and we launch a task, there's a data field in the, uh, in the task protobuf that we populate. And we then extract that in the executor, right? So really all the executor does is it's got the launch, it's started, it pulls out the data that the scheduler sent it. So it could read all the configuration information, all of what it needs to be able to go and launch and start the application, right? And it's actually a really important fundamental uh, kind of wiring that, uh, that exists that we'll, we'll get into. <clears throat> so just quickly, uh, so here's kind of the functionality around the REST API. Uh, so obviously, you've got to start the scheduler. Um, once the scheduler started, you can go in and you can add brokers. Uh, you can update them. So you can update uh, the resources. You can update the configurations. Uh, you can remove brokers from the cluster. Um, you can start brokers. You can stop brokers. So if you want to go and like, reconfigure something, you can go ahead and stop it, update it, start it, um, all through the command line, all very simple without having to really do much of anything. Uh, no chef, no puppet, right? None of that. Um, we also built in rebalancing. I think there's a new feature that's a pull request for like adding topics, right? So we've added a lot of functionality into the scheduler that you would kind of expect from tooling, um, but the tooling is part of what the scheduler can provide, right? <clears throat> and it's, I mean, it's really simple. You could launch, you know, 20 brokers in a couple seconds. It's really awesome. All right, so enough about Kafka. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, when you don't have a scheduler. Um, so th let's, let's uh, assume these are partitions. And you've got you know, partition one, two, three, four, five. That's totally six. That's all right. <laughs> all good. Off by one. All good. Engineer. Um, and let's say you have consumers, right? So if this was the problem, let's, let's make this our problem statement. So how would you go ahead and figure out, how would the consumers figure out which partitions they should read from, right? Well, let's use consensus. Yay, consensus, everyone loves consensus, right? So the consumers can go ahead and they could run 
and they can talk to each other, but uh, they're doing it through you know, some application like Zookeeper, right, where you're able to do things like leader election and barriers and distributed locking and consensus, right? All right, cool. So the consumers, they get you know, their, uh, their ducks in a row. They figure out who's going to be reading from what partition, and all the consumers are happy. You know, they've, they've split up their work accordingly, and all is well. Now, if there's a failure, right, then what happens is the consumers need to do another you know, consensus run, right, another rebalance. Um, so what they decide to do is go ahead and, you know, like C1 and C3 are now going to split and read from these you know, different partitions, right? So this is actually not so bad, right? This is, this is what we have today without schedulers. It's actually you know, not, not, not terrible. All right, so let's see what this looks like when you use a scheduler. <clears throat> All right, so same problem, uh, same off by one <laughs> partition numbering. Um, but here, now that we have a scheduler, uh, we really can solve the consensus problem by removing having to ever do consensus. So with the scheduler, right, instead of having multiple applications sitting out there trying to figure out how to coordinate with each other, the scheduler is a single thread, if you can think of it that way, right? It's a process, it's a single process. It's able to control uh, and dictate all of what should be happening for the applications that it's launching. So in the scheduler world, what the scheduler can do is it can go ahead and launch the three different consumers, and when the scheduler launches the three different consumers, the scheduler knows all the statuses of what's happening, and the scheduler can pass the information to the uh, consumers that have launched and the executor, saying, you know, here are the partitions that you should be reading from, right? This becomes very powerful because when there's a failure, right, that's all right, no big deal, right? Mesos will just, like, reschedule the task for us. I mean, obviously, the scheduler does that, right? So the scheduler would go ahead and just reschedule the task. You don't have to worry about things like rebalancing, coordination. And this is a really powerful, fundamental uh, uh, benefit for building a scheduler, right? Mesos really is a platform for building distributed systems. And when you're building a distributed system like this, it's so much better to have a single, uh, a single control to be able to coordinate and orchestrate all of the applications, all of what's happening within your software of, that's actually running, and not having to worry about things like consensus. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, schedulers working together. All right, so um, I, don't know, I don't know how uh, familiar folks were with Marathon, so I, I kind of wanted just to talk through it a little bit. So here's a diagram of what it looks like to run Marathon, essentially. So you've got the Mesos master. Marathon is a scheduler, right? And what Marathon does is it has this concept of like apps and groups, and you can kind of you know, uh, take apps and group them together, which is great. And the apps ultimately are the tasks that are going to run, um, you know, the instances that are actually going to run on the slave. Um, now, the Marathon doesn't actually have an executor. It uses the command executor uh, from Mesos. So really all it's doing is just, a, you know, like a su-c, right? It's just launching uh, whatever you're passing to it. And when that happens, um, you kind of get into the situation where you have to deal with things like artifacts and configurations and service discovery and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to start actually baking in and building into your software, right? So when you're deploying applications on Marathon, there's a lot more work that goes into, uh, you know, actually making the system work. So, you know, in, in come schedulers, right? Um, <clears throat> instead, what you could do is build a scheduler that uh, can run on Marathon. It can launch tasks. Uh, it could handle all the service discovery and artifact and configuration and passing that information to the tasks that are launched. And you could also have uh, the schedulers be orchestrated by another scheduler, right? So you could have schedulers sitting out there having specific uh, independent, uh, let's use the buzzword microservice kind of you know, functionality, right? Where they're each self-contained for whatever they're specifically supposed to do and then having another scheduler or two or three or whatever it is to be able to control and orchestrate and run uh, all the independent different uh, you know, features and functionality that the other schedulers are actually providing. <clears throat> so this is kind of a um, little peek under the hood of our uh, part of our platform. So I kind of wanted to talk through this because it's a great example of uh, different schedulers and kind of what they do and then the other piece parts of you know, the schedulers and how they run those schedulers and, and why. So 
That's a lot of stuff here. All right, <laughs> so um, let's, uh, let's kind of start on the uh, left-hand side. So uh, we have a scheduler which we call Geppetto. And Geppetto is basically for spinning up schedulers that are for things like uh, monitoring and, and, and logging. So we have uh, a syslog scheduler, a statsd scheduler, and a syscollect scheduler. Right? So the syslog scheduler is really just a syslog server. Uh, statsd uh, is a statsd server. And syscollect is a server that runs on the slave and pings the slave endpoints, does some other checks on the local machine. And all of these uh, applications, uh, they're, all, they're, all, they're all open source, but they're all custom. They all actually produce their data to Kafka. So what the Geppetto scheduler does is it figures out, based on what you're trying to deploy, um, what collection needs to happen. Right? You may actually have an application that you want to have a specific statsd server for so that you can put metadata into the metrics that may not be coming in. Um, and this is actually a really important concept here because uh, when you look at this type of diagram, like if you look at like Triceratops at the top, there's multiple different slices of those. So when, when you build software on Mesos, you can kind of namespace it, right? You could actually have a you know, Joe Stein dev environment, uh, you know, a Nate dev environment, a QA environment, right? And all of these are just you know, the same stack maybe with different resources, maybe with different configurations, um, but ultimately there's like some namespacing there. So you may want to launch a syslog server, a statsd server, that's specifically for you know, Joe's dev environment. You want to have another one for production, right? You want to have another one for whatever different types of environments that um, you're running, and then that way that data can actually flow down through to Kafka and then get analyzed in you know, Spark jobs and, and you know, displayed in dashboards and all that fun stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> That's kind of that part. Um, on the right-hand side, we have uh, Exhibitor. Uh, so there's an Exhibitor scheduler. Um, running a Zookeeper on Mesos is definitely not for the faint of heart. Uh, but if you run Exhibitor on Mesos, it's way better. Um, and there's an Exhibitor scheduler now that'll allow you to do that uh, as well. So um, the Hydra system in Triceratops is basically going to orchestrate you know, all of this stack down here, which is for all of the collection of all of the logging events that are happening. And the uh, Hydra and Triceratops schedulers are basically controlling the artifacts, the configuration, all the service discovery information. Right? So if you kind of like start to flow through this diagram, you have something like, OK, I need to start up a syslog server. And when that syslog server produces data, it needs to produce to some topic, and it needs to know where to connect to it. Right? So all of that information could actually just be passed down from the top scheduler all the way down through the other schedulers right into the executor when it launches. So you don't have to worry about you know, service discovery or, or, or building software to be able to like, go and pull configurations and such. Um, so <clears throat> uh, on, on this side, this is a pretty simple, basic you know, Kafka stack, Kafka exhibitor. We have our consumer that can you know, post the data over either to a data center um, or to another part of the system. And then there's a, another scheduler that we built. Uh, all, all these components here that I'm talking about are open source. Uh, so syslog, statsy, syscall, phoenix, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the Kafka scheduler, exhibitor, um, you know, all of those are open source schedulers um, that you can check out if you want. It's uh, github.com slash stealthly, S-T-E-A-L-T-H-L-Y. Um, so uh, Phoenix is uh, a scheduler for actually backing up Kafka data. So it'll actually, it uses C-Core, which is Pinterest's uh, kind of like Kafka backup system. Um, and it'll actually back up a Kafka cluster to uh, S3 it's, as it's running, right? So you kind of have this system where you want to be able to do uh, you know, log collection and metric collection. You need to have all these Kafka brokers. And the responsibility of the main schedulers are for figuring out what you actually need to run, right? If you're just doing a simple, tiny little dev environment, Right? You probably only need one Kafka broker with 0.5 CPU. So the, the configurations for that could all be managed within the top scheduler and then you know, trickle down through the rest of the scheduler so they basically know, you know how to stamp themselves up. Right? These, this is a stack. So the stack has to know how to run itself. Um, so the configuration information is defined, and then all of the schedulers basically go and do their thing. Right? So the syscall uh, scheduler is a good example of um, a scheduler that really just looks at slaves and it'll just run stuff on it. So if it sees a slave and it sees that it's not running anything on the slave, it'll just go and execute a you know a very small little 
uh, application on it so that it can kind of do its work and do its job um, and such. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, framework API and then some examples. <clears throat> All right, so really, if you've never built a scheduler before, I would say the first thing you should do is go check out the Mesos protocol buffers. Um, it's a pretty big file, and there's a lot of information in there. Um, it's all good to read, and you should definitely go and read it. But from the scheduler perspective, you can probably just start with the framework info, task info, and task date. So the framework info is basically the protobuf that the scheduler uses to talk to the master. Um, it's going to set the framework ID. It's going to set the failover. right? So when you have a scheduler, um, you basically want to checkpoint the scheduler using the replicated log. right? So Mesos has this thing called the replicated log. And what you could do is you could actually check, checkpoint the tasks so that if the scheduler dies, none of your tasks fail. Right? So you always want to set that to true. Um, it actually may already be set to true now by default. I'm not sure um, under the hood. But um, anyway, you also have to set the failover timeout because there's some time that you know, is going to elapse uh, if the scheduler is down. How long is the scheduler down before Mesos is going to go and, un and, and basically delete the framework, essentially? So uh, you want to set that pretty large like a year-ish. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's the framework info. It's a couple fields. Uh, task info, task info is kind of really where, uh, you know, where really all the magic happens, right? The task info is basically uh, providing all the information that you need uh, uh, you know, to be able to go ahead and launch your task, essentially. Um, and as I said before, one of the fields in the task info is this data field, which is kind of this like, you know, magic little way to be able to push data over to the executor. So when the executor launches, you've basically given it the data uh, for you know, what it needs. Right? If it's a JVM process, you may want to pass in JVM args, right? <clears throat> et cetera, whatever it might be. Um, so you, you kind of you know, work, through, work through that uh, process. Um, task state, real simple. It's just all the different states that a task could have in a cluster. So you should check that out and understand it. You know, staging, started, failed, lost, et cetera. Um, and then there's also master info and slave info, which you'll see in the callback functions that you're going to end up working with. Um, not a lot there. It's pretty, you know, just slave info, master info. It's not, not a lot, but you should still, you know, check it out and understand it. Um, it's going to be one of the objects uh, that you're going to have to work with in your functions. <clears throat> All right, so there's a pretty good development guide. Um, I'm going to talk through it a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, definitely the documentation is great, so uh, check it out. Uh, so the scheduler API uh, kind of broke it up into a few different parts here. So there's uh, registered, re-registered, and disconnected. Right? So these are all callbacks. So when the scheduler starts, um, you go ahead and you know, you've got either a pure native connection to Mesos or you, you're losing, using libmesos. And basically, once the master registers the framework, you get a notification of that. Right? You get your callback function. Uh, it gets called. Um, if you disconnect and you reconnect, right? you're going to get a re-registration callback. Um, if you know, disconnected, et cetera, you know, pretty, pretty obvious. Um, so, and then there's resource offers. right? So resource offers is just like it sounds. right? These are the offers that Mesos is actually sending to you. So there's a callback function. And every time Mesos sends you a resource offer, you're going to basically be getting called. right? Your function gets called. And you implement your, uh, your business logic there. Uh, to decide whether or not you want to accept the offer or you want to uh, decline the offer. Uh, there's also offer rescinded. So you know, Mesos could actually send back and say that you know, this offer has been rescinded. Um, there's status updates. Uh, so a status update, uh, when an executor launches, uh, you, could actually, you, know, you actually have to go and say task running. And that will be a status update. So the scheduler knows kind of what's going on with all the different executors. Um, that all kind of comes through the status update. And then there's framework message. Uh, I've honestly never really used and implemented the framework message. There's like a big like disclaimer, you know, this may not be reliable, blah, blah, blah. So you know, it's probably good if you want to use framework message for like little piece parts of information. But I have just generally gone with the approach of just open a socket. And if you need the executors to talk to the scheduler, just have a socket connection so that the scheduler could just have you know, all the communication to all the executors uh, you know, all, all to yourself. And then of course, slave lost, executor lost. Um, and then any errors and such, right? These are all callback functions. On the executor side, same register, re-register, disconnected. Uh, launch task, uh, right? So when the task is launching, 
this is the function that's going to get called. So when you want to implement and actually run your application, whatever that might be, um, let's say you have a Java application, uh, then you use the Java API and you implement the launch task callback. And once the task launches, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do, right? Just whatever it might be. Uh, same thing with the kill task. So like if your task is getting killed, you get the message. Um, and then same you know, framework message as well for, for the other direction. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I, I wanted to bring up task reconciliation. I don't know, this gets missed a lot, I think, when I've looked at folks' schedulers. Uh, task rec reconciliation is kind of an important thing. Um, so there's no state that's held within the schedulers uh, around like, what's actually happening on the cluster. So if your framework disconnects uh, and it reconnects, it's, there's a potential that all of your tasks have failed, right? Or you know, maybe some tasks failed. So you need to do some reconciliation. So there's two ways to do that. You could either do an explicit, hey, here are the tasks that I want, or you can just you know, query all the tasks that uh, your scheduler has, and then you have to go through and reconcile um, you know, like if the task had failed. Now your scheduler has to go make sure that it's going to relaunch it. Um, so there's a little bit of development that you've got to kind of do on the reconciliation side. Um, it's definitely like one of those like, you know, gotchas when you're building a scheduler. Some folks just forget about this. And then all of a sudden, like, their scheduler like, reconnects, and nothing works. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's silly, but it's, uh, you kind of have to do this for now. I think eventually this may get put into um, you know, either the driver or maybe some other part of the Mesa system so that this isn't required. But for now, it's something that you got to do. And there's, again, great documentation about this as well. <clears throat> uh, there's a bunch of language bindings. So uh, you know, it's exciting to hear about the HTTP API. I mean, that's really cool and awesome. Um, you know, for now, there are a bunch of other uh, you know, application, uh, sorry, language uh, examples, and also uh, pure, not libmesos required, uh, direct connect to Mesos. So you know, we've got stuff in C++. Um, you've got an example in Python. And then uh, Brian Wickman from Twitter has got Pesos, which is a pure Python implementation that doesn't use libmesos. Um, I, I forget the name of the project that Pesos uses that he created off the top of my head. Um, but it actually implements you know, what libmesos does purely in Python. Um, same thing on the Java side, the Groupon folks called you know, JSOS, um, so that you can actually have a, you know, a, a non-libmesos uh, pure Java implementation. Um, or you could just use libmesos if you want. It works, right? It, it's fine. Uh, and then you could use the Java APIs, and there's examples in Java. Uh, on Go, this is a pure Go implementation. Uh, so you could, write, uh, you, know, you could write your frameworks in Go. Um, and then Clojure, there's uh, two frameworks. I mean, if there's more that people know about, let me know, um, of course. Uh, so David Greenberg, uh, he created a Clojure Mesos one. And then uh, PYR uh, uh, created one as well. Uh, and then there's a, you know, you can, obviously anything you can do in Java, you can do in Scala, but there's a Scala examples that Mesosphere has, um, so you could actually build a Scala framework actually really quickly and simply. And one of the things that I like about the language bindings is that, um, I mean, you have to implement all these callbacks. So even with the HTTP API, like, I can envision that there's going to be all the different languages, you know, JavaScript and Pascal and you know whatever it is, it's gonna you're gonna end up having to implement against the Rust API, right? So there's gonna be a new kind of cycle of development that's gonna kind of you know bring about connecting to that Rust API. Um, you know, for now, uh, using these language bindings are great because you've got all the functions, right? You don't have to worry about like, oh, you know, is it like what's the function name to launch a task, right? All of that's going to be in the examples for you, right? It's a kind of like a template that you can use uh, to basically go and build a scheduler and an executor. And I mean, if you're proficient, like you could build a scheduler and an executor probably in you know, uh, you know, maybe an hour tops, like if it's the first time, just doing something really simple, right? Just launching a task and having it, you know, email you or, or whatever it is that you want to do. <clears throat> and then there's also a project uh, called Renler. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of different examples in all those languages. Uh, it's basically a web page renderer from a hackathon. Um, I think Adam and Nicholas and Elizabeth are going to be doing a, uh, like a framework kind of uh, like workshop tomorrow, I think at 1.30, something like that. Uh, so if this is kind of interesting stuff to you, and you really want to you know, get kind of more down and dirty around it, um, you know, go to that talk. 
uh, catch me afterwards, you know, whatever. Uh, and that's it. Uh, any questions, thoughts, comments, tomatoes? Crickets? Yeah. Yeah. So not the task reconciliation part, but all of these examples uh, have that, basically. So there are all, all these examples, like the Python one, the C++ one, the Java one. They all you could you could literally just compile them and just run them, and they'll just work. Um, you can start from there. As far as the reconciliation part, I'd say go check out the Kafka scheduler. There's not. It's maybe six lines of code to do the reconciliation, if that. Um, so, uh, or the Cassandra one, right? There's, uh, you know, look in Marathon as well. Um, yeah. Is there a question? Yep. Hey, uh, hey. Hey, what are some pitfalls that you can get into? You might not realize until later. You mentioned the uh, reconciliation. Any other ones? Yeah, so um, not hogging resources, right? So when you get an offer, uh, you want to make sure that you're always going to decline it if you're not going to use it, right? Because if you don't, you'll hold on to it, and then there'll be no resources like offered to any other schedulers, right? So that's an important thing. Is like you know every scheduler is getting these offers. If you're holding on to it, you know you've got to you got to say declined, right? So those are th those are those are important. And I'd say um, you know being able to build out uh, something that allows you to interact with it is also important too. Right? So you build a scheduler, and now all of a sudden it's running, and you have some problem, and you can't actually do anything about it, because you've tried to put all the intelligence into the software, and no human operator can go and do something. Right? So you should always like, allow for the executors to have some control from some human being, if need be, at some point in time, whether it's starting or stopping or, or whatever it might be. And maybe I'll think of some others. That, that's all I can think of for right now. Any other questions? Um, I mean, not really. So the question was, are there any gotchas around scheduling schedulers on Marathon? Um, yeah, I mean, you just take the scheduler and you package it like you would any other app. I mean, you could throw it in a Docker container, right? The scheduler is not really doing that much. It's pretty, you know, I mean, if you have a large enough cluster, obviously it's going to get a need to have, uh, you know, a little bit more CPU and RAM. Um, but it, you know, you can throw it in a Docker container or launch that on Mesos. Uh, you know, there's really not too much to that. I'd say like the only thing is that you have to make sure that you set your failover timeout. I, that would be a gotcha, right? You got to set check. You have to set checkpointing to true. Again, that may already be default by now. Um, but you have to set the failover timeout, right? Like otherwise, what happens is your scheduler fails, and if it keeps failing and doesn't re-register, basically what will happen is uh, you know your all your tasks will get lost. And like not lost as like I can't find them like they'll be killed and they're gone and then your framework gets like you know unregistered and then if you go ahead and try to re-register again it'll fail so what happens is like you have this thing that's called a framework ID and you basically when you launch a scheduler you have to hold the framework ID in some state throw it in Zookeeper or in the replicated log or wherever it doesn't matter and um, if you go through that cycle and try to like register with an already like unregistered uh, like a, a you know a, a deleted framework. It just won't work. You just get an error. And you're kind of in a situation where it's like, uh, this is not good, <laughs> right? Um, especially if you have other state around that framework ID, you're going to be going into Zookeeper and like, you know, editing the Z node by hand, right? Everyone's done that. Admit it. It's OK. It's all good. So, yep. Yep. Okay, so the question was. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, so the question is there like, is there framework resources and how does that relate to task resources, right? So everything is task resources. There's no framework resource. So when the scheduler runs, it's actually a task, right? So it's a task for the marathon scheduler. Um, everything is just task resources. Like if you go through the documentation, like when I first started with Mesos like a year and a half ago, I was like, where's this framework? Like if you look in all the examples, the word framework doesn't even exist, right? And I was like, where's this framework? It's a, you know, it's a, like a, almost like a philosophical concept, right? If you look in the protobufs, like there's a framework ID, right? And you go into the UI, there's a framework. Um, but uh, it's just the scheduler and the executor and the two drivers, and then everything is just, uh, just task resources. And that's it. Yeah, no, 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 it's a, it's a good question. So it's like, uh, where does all of the state and information about what all the schedulers are doing and where does that go? Does that capture that-ish? Sure. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I mean, if you just build like five schedulers and run them in Marathon, you're still gonna have to create some layer of code that's gonna have to understand that. And yeah, I think it, that's where it's going. I mean, that's what we've been doing is we've been building schedulers that can go and, you know, and let me, I kind of didn't bring this part up, it's kind of important. Yeah, so the orchestration scheduler, right? Like one of the, you know, the micro schedulers, <laughs> uh, like they have a REST API, right? So if you wanna be able to do things like auto scaling, right? It's like, hey, it's, you know, 2 a.m., I don't need all these brokers running because I want to free up resources or whatever, then the orchestration scheduler can handle that concept of things like auto scaling, right? It can look at your environment and understand all the different piece parts that actually need to change and then it can go and ping on the REST API to do whatever it needs to do, right? Lower resources, increase resources, stop applications, start them, and then, yeah, I mean, that, that becomes in and of itself, you know, it, it may not be scheduling resources per se, but it is, you know, fundamentally like doing orchestration and scheduling, right? Like, we, we, we do often when, like, I think maybe we have one scheduler that doesn't, you know, actually uh, create tasks, uh, but for the most part, you know, they're, they're gonna do that, right? And it's also responsible for launching on Marathon, right? So actually talking to Marathon, launching the applications in Marathon, right? Yeah, it's a, like a, it's a software application that, you know, should be doing that. And if it's not a scheduler, right? If it's not some like process that's running all the time, what you're gonna end up doing is basically building a whole, you know, s like stack of scripts for deploying, updating, configuring, and, and that, that a human has to then go and you know, work on. Or, I mean, you could script that, right? I mean, you could always automate, but it's still just a static. Yeah. From your experience, do you think that's the sort of thing that you, like, in your, you know, your work, is your orchestration schedule something that really should be extracted into an open source uh, generic tool? Maybe. Or Yeah, you know, it's one of those hard things because it's like, it's always so, you know, uh, you know, I get to see a lot of different implementations and, you know, there's always that fine line of like, everyone does service discovery different. Everyone does configuration different. And the thing is, is that unless you're a brain spanking new startup, you already have, you know, a configuration system. You've already got service discovery. You already have existing systems, right? So it, you know, yeah, maybe there's a way to make it generic um, at some point. I don't know if like, we're at the point where we can really see and understand that. But yeah, I mean, that would be fantastic to have you know, some, some you know, better way to do that. I saw that um, you know, Netflix has actually started doing that. They open source today like, some libraries and stuff. I gotta check more, check more out about it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of where it's going, right? Yep. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> that's actually a, that's a good point that uh, I guess I didn't really bring up at all. So um, you need to have some location where the uh, tarball for the executor is actually going to sit. And any other anything else that you need to also download. So in Mesos, you have like a URI, right, um, on the command executor, like for Marathon. You actually kind of have to implement and build that, I mean, kind of have to implement and build that yourself, right? The storm works that way. The Kafka scheduler works that way. I mean, it actually just has like an HTTP server in the scheduler that allows you to download the files. So what you do is you take the scheduler and then all of the files that are expected and then launch it. And then, you know, Mesos will go ahead and download those, uh, you know, from, from the scheduler, right? You give Mesos the URIs, Mesos downloads it, unzips it, and then, you know, registers itself, right? It registers your executor and such. Cool. Any, any other questions? All right, thanks, folks. Appreciate it.